Romans 14. Our study this morning begins in verse 15. We're going to back where we finished last time through the end of the chapter. Uh, You might think of this as love trumps liberty. That's what we read today. Would you read along with me, please? Paul says, if your brother is distressed because of what you eat, you're no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy your brother for whom Christ died. Do not allow what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. I want to read that again. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of following rules, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a man to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything else that will cause your brother to fall. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. In other words, it's nobody else's business. Blessed, literally it's happy, is the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves. But the man who has doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith. And everything that does not come from faith is sin. Father, we sometimes have issues with balance. Don't do's and do's, well, those are pretty easy for us to understand. But in these gray areas, these disputable matters, at times it's hard for us to process. So I'm asking you to help us understand your heart, and in understanding your heart, we will find the biblical balance that Paul has been emphasizing throughout this chapter. May we here at Calvary Chapel of San Antonio continue to pay this unpayable debt of love that never goes away, that's always sort of our first order of business. Help us to love one another. Jesus, we don't know if you're going to start another revival. But if you do, we'd like it to begin here with us. So let us be the men and women that you can count on to put others first, all the while doing this for your glory. Jesus, if there's anyone on this final Friday, or final Sunday rather, in February, if there's anyone here who doesn't know you, and this are the two services that follow, we ask that you would move on their heart like Elvie or Sophie in the play. We don't want anyone to be left behind. So ask them to be yours for your glory. All of these things we pray that your name would be magnified. Amen. If you are anything at all like me, from the time that you became a Christian, you've been thinking about revival. Now, I'm not talking about personal revival, but we're talking about one of those revivals that sort of turns the world right side up for Jesus Christ. In my lifetime, we've experienced one. Now, not in my lifetime as a Christian. Sadly, I was too stubborn and too proud, uh, though I am old enough. I miss the whole Jesus people revival of the late 60s and the early 70s. It's a revival that had tremendous, long-lasting impact, not just in this country, but primarily in this country. And people's lives, the world that we live in, especially in the United States, was dramatically changed as a result. We all want to see that move of God in our lives. You know, because I wasn't there at the time, I have a lot of friends who were. They were just hippies who were getting saved at the time, God reaching out to the outcast of society, the the ones that were deemed hopeless beyond help. And when you talk to them, you say, well, what was it like? And without exception, they all talk about the love. 
They would say you would go into a meeting. It didn't matter where it was. You'd go into a meeting and the love was so palpable. It was like you could cut it. And everybody just loved. There was no arguing. Everybody was so glad when anybody got saved. There was very little discussion about doctrine. They just wanted to hear about Jesus. And then the Holy Spirit began to raise those people up. And doctrine, of course, matters a great deal. But you see, revival happened because of love. And I'm afraid that unless we learn to love, we're not going to see another revival before Jesus returns. Again, I want it to happen. I hope and pray you want it to happen. But it has to start one Christian at a time. It has to start with you and me putting other people first. I want you to think about it. Unless you're brand new here to Calvary Chapel, you know what my personal feelings are on social media. Whether it's Facebook or Twitter or the blogs that are out there. Just this past week, the Church of Jesus Christ has been embarrassed with Billy Graham going home to be with Jesus. The Christian, the so-called Christian blogosphere. (laughs) lit up many, many, many professing Christians condemning him to hell because he taught this wrong or he taught that wrong or he was too ecumenical or whatever their complaint was. He didn't believe the way we believe. There's no possibility of revival with those kinds of hearts. And to have those statements made in the name of Jesus Christ is something that we should all be ashamed of. Now, I know it wasn't any of you, but before you discount it, check your own Facebook feed. Chase your own arguments about the politics of the day, the candidate you voted for or didn't vote for. Are you in or are you out according to what others are saying? Are you involved in trying to convince people that your way is the right way? If revival is going to happen, I want it to start here at Calvary Chapel, San Antonio. So the only thing I'm concerned about today, the only thing I'm concerned about is that we who are born-again believers here at Calvary Chapel of San Antonio would say, Jesus, let that revival begin in me, in my heart. And the only way to do that is to learn to put Jesus Christ first and foremost in your life, And then to put others before you. If you can do that, maybe we'll have our own little revival and it will spread. I often think about the first century church where our teaching in the book of Acts on Friday nights. And the one thing that was remarkable above any and everything else was how they loved one another. They couldn't wait to get together. They couldn't wait to study the word together. They couldn't wait to help others, even at their own expense. And considering that, all this talk about food and drink and all the disputable areas that we've been talking about the last couple of Sundays seems so insignificant compared to this issue of love. So let's, you and I together, finish this chapter by offering our bodies, our hearts to Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior, saying, Jesus, let's this revival begin right here in me. It requires you to step aside, to step outside of yourself and to bring others in and to live your life for them because that's what Jesus did for you. He begins in verse 15. He says, If your brother is distressed because of what you eat, you're no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy your brother for whom Christ died. Now, we can never forget that at the core of this entire discussion for the entire chapter is this continuing debt of love that we owe to one another. These things seem insignificant. Well, you do it. I'm not going to do it. But remember, we owe a continuing debt, an unpayable debt of love to everybody. Thus, if our freedom causes others distress, well, then we're no longer acting in love, are we? And if love is going to be the prime directive here, we need to understand. Paul says here that the really mature Christian understands the need, in fact, the duty to yield our own freedoms 
for the benefit of those who are less mature, less instructed, or perhaps even mistaken in what they believe. Now, you remember last week, Paul just said that he enjoys eating meat. Well, what we have to do in these other disputable areas that are more culturally impactful for us, we have to ask, are we willing, as Paul was, to give up something that we enjoy for no reason other than love for our brothers and sisters and that we don't want to cause them to stumble? Or, on the negative side, do we protect our own liberties even at the expense of others? Love decides is the idea here. Martin Luther, whose life was changed by the book of Romans, said it this way, A Christian is a man most free, Lord of all, and subject to no one. Now, if it stopped there, we would say, that's exactly what I'm talking about. But listen to what he continues. He says, But a Christian is also a most dutiful servant of all, subject to all. And you wonder, well, how can both of those things be? Well, that's what biblical balance is all about. The best thing we can do, and this is going to be the theme throughout our study this morning, is sacrifice our freedom, sacrifice our liberty for the benefit of others. And that's when, according to Paul, we are the most Christ-like that we will ever be. Biblical balance isn't rejecting your freedom because somebody makes you or forces you to do so. It's setting your liberties aside, counting it as nothing compared to loving others before loving yourself. What's our example? Well, Jesus, we're told in Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 5, he said, your attitude, that's your mindset and mine, ought to be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. He had it. But he let it go, and he let it go in your name and in my name. He let equality with God go. He left the worship of angels. He left the infinite confines. I know that's sort of an oxymoron, but I think it makes the point well. Of heaven, and he did it in your name and in my name. He made himself, Paul says, nothing, and he did it for you and for me. How much more? Should we who call on him as our Lord and Savior be willing to do that for other brothers and sisters in the Lord? So he says in verse 16, do not allow what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. Now last time we talked about disputable matters, drinking or smoking or all kinds of different issues. I want to let you run wild a bit with your creativity for a moment. Imagine that you invited somebody from the church over, their whole family came over to your house, and you set out a meal before them, and you just thought you had a wonderful evening talking about the Lord, and as soon as your guests left, you turned to your wife or you turned to your husband and said, you know, that was a great evening. I hope we can have them back again. It was just a whole evening of talking about Jesus. Imagine that the minute your guests leave, The husband looks at the wife, or the wife looks at the husband and says, can you believe they offered us wine? Or can you believe that they were smoking? Can you believe that he offered me a beer? Maybe on the legalist side, he would say, I I thought they were actually Christians. Well, what's happened is your good is now being spoken of of evil because of your exercise of Christian liberty. Is there anything wrong with you having a glass of wine with dinner? No, of course not, unless Jesus tells you that there is. But what about your guests? You see, you don't know, you never know what's going on in their lives. Let me add one more element to this discussion. What if the husband and the wife have been having arguments privately? About one or the other of them drinking a little bit too much at home. And on one side, there was one party saying, please don't drink. Our our children are watching. Please don't do that. And on the other side, the, the, the person was saying, well, look, I'm free in Christ to do that. There's nothing wrong with doing that. And now as they leave your home, the battle begins. One of them is thinking, I can't believe they offered us wine. We've been going through this battle in our own home. And the other is saying, well, see, I knew it was okay. They're mature Christians. I knew it was okay to drink wine. So I'm going to stop off at the store and get a six-pack on the way home. You see, do not allow 
what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. Now, I know, and we talked about this last time, but I know that what you do or don't do should never impact anyone else's walk with Jesus. But we have to be real here. What we do does impact. It always has and it always will. And Satan, of course, is going to use any opportunity to destroy any immature Christian, certainly to divide families in cases that, like the one I've described. So the question for us is, how can we reconcile our can-dos versus somebody else's cannot-dos? Well, we have to understand the principle of sacrifice, and that's where Paul goes, beginning in verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now, it's awkward to break that up here, but I want to stop for just a moment because there's always the legal who says, well, if we don't have rules, if you say it's okay to do these things, then people are going to take advantage of it. They're just going to sin, sin, sin. No, verse 17 makes it very clear that the kingdom of God is a matter of righteousness. It doesn't give us license to sin, do anything we want, to to just run wild with our consciences. Because the kingdom of God is a matter of righteousness. What we want to do as believers is leave the conviction of the one who calls himself or herself a believer. We want to leave that conviction up to God the Holy Spirit. And all we do then is sacrifice our freedom so that we don't put a stumbling block in anybody else's way. Paul then says that anyone who understands that the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, he then says anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. Now I like that because sometimes we we know we're pleasing to God. I'm doing these things for you, Jesus, but I'm having a really hard time with people. But the whole idea here is that men will acknowledge your godly walk, your Christ-likeness. You remember Barnabas. In the book of Acts, at the very beginning of the church, he just brought all of his possessions, dumped them out at the feet of the apostles and said, you know, all of this is yours for for the church, for this new body. And everybody marveled at his generosity. Everybody wondered at his love for God and his love for people. That's what Paul is telling us. Paul, in these two verses is elevating your Christian walk in mind to a much higher plane than what we can do or what we cannot do. He's telling us that belonging to Jesus isn't about external things, it's internal things. The external things are those that so disgusted Jesus when he looked at the behavior of the self-righteous Pharisees. Remember, whoa, 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 he pronounced seven woes. Because outwardly they did all the right things, but inwardly their hearts were filthy. Whitewashed graves, he called them. Broods of vipers, he called them. Why? Because the external didn't match the internal. And Jesus is always and only concerned, as I've told you many, many times over the years, he's concerned with our hearts. Jesus was disgusted by the outward display of religiosity because he knew the condition of all men's hearts. The truly mature Christian And that's what every one of us ought to strive to be. If this is your second day as a Christian, you got saved yesterday, you showed up in church. Every day you should desire to be more like Jesus. You should desire to be mature. And the mature believer learns that real joy and real peace comes when we imitate Jesus. And today he's asking us to imitate him by giving up those things that we're free to do to benefit other people. Now, I want this to be clear, and it's difficult to explain. I'll do the best I can. Remember in our study last time, Paul called the legalist the weaker brother. Uh, He said the man or the woman who learns to enjoy their freedom is the the stronger believer, the stronger Christian. Galatians 5.1 says that it is for freedom that Christ set us free, so it's the mature believer that is pleasing to God. But, and here's where it may sound a little bit confusing, what Paul is telling us now is that the brother who enjoys his freedom at the expense of the weaker brother is really the weaker brother. Does that make sense? He's really the weaker brother. You see, unless we're willing, and I mean happily so, to sacrifice our freedom to benefit others, we aren't mature at all. In fact, we're worse than just being weak Christians. We are selfish. 
rather than selfless believers. Why? Because our job is to please the Lord. That's all. Now, this is another place that sounds confusing. We are pleasing to God. If you're a believer, he loves you. He's crazy about you. But we also have to live our lives in a way that's pleasing to God. We need to live our lives in a way that says, I am a Christian, Christ's man, or Christ's woman. I'm a reflection of him as opposed to being a reflection upon him. We never please Jesus more than when we sacrifice our freedom for others. We do it for his glory just because he did it for us. Let me illustrate this with the story of Paul and Timothy. You remember Paul, who is the anti-legalist, forced Timothy to be circumcised. Even after withstanding Peter and James to the face, saying, no, no, circumcision isn't required if you're going to be a Christian. Now remember, Timothy was half Jew and half Gentile. And Paul, the anti-legalist, comes to Timothy and says, okay, I want you to be circumcised. Now, I probably shouldn't use the word force, but he said, Timothy, this would be the right thing for you to do. Now, we would look at that and say, well, Paul, you're being a hypocrite. And Paul's response would be, no, this isn't hypocrisy at all. This is the kingdom of God at work. Let me explain the reason that Paul wanted Timothy to be circumcised. Even though he didn't have to, the law didn't require him to, he as a Christian was free from the law. But the reason was to enlarge Timothy's ministry and sphere of influence. Paul knew that no Jew would have ever listened to Timothy were he not circumcised. Timothy wouldn't have been able to preach in a temple or a synagogue ever, and that was Paul's method of operation. He would go first to the Jew. He would find a synagogue, or if it was a city that didn't have enough Jews to have a synagogue, he would go by the river where the Jews would meet on the Sabbath, and that's where they would proclaim Jesus Christ, crucified and risen from the dead. And Timothy couldn't have fulfilled his calling unless he'd been circumcised. So Paul said, Timothy, for the sake of your ministry, are you willing to do this? Now, one of the things that I've seen other pastors do a lot, and I've talked to my pastors here about it as well, there are a lot of things that we can do to limit our sphere of influence. We can limit our ministry opportunities. I know a man who prided himself on being just sort of a radical hippie and just sort of said off-the-wall things. And they opened a church the first Sunday. There was 500 people there. And everybody loved it because he would preach in bare feet and, and just, you know, was just a radical hippie. Problem is, he stayed a radical hippie. No, this is who I am. I got to be true to myself. Well, that church doesn't exist anymore and it didn't exist for very long. Why? Because he limited his ministry opportunities. If only hippies are coming in, you don't have much of an audience. I've talked to all of my pastors here about tattoos. Nothing wrong with tattoos. They're free to get them and enjoy them. I actually like them. If I wasn't so adverse to pain, I would have some. And by the way, a tattoo just doesn't look the same on old wrinkled skin as it does on some of these younger guys. But the more tattoos they get, the more limited their audience is going to be. There are going to be some people who just won't hear. Paul is simply saying, Timothy, do this. Timothy made the painful sacrifice as an adult being circumcised simply to enjoy everything that God had for him. And so Paul was really doing Timothy a favor. The result would be that Timothy would get so many more rewards by sacrificing his freedom than by holding on to it. The point for us, I hope, is simple. You're just as free in the Lord to say no to things as you are to say yes to things. Whenever anybody asks you something, what do you think about this? These should be matters of conscience between you and and the Lord. We need to learn to give up our personal freedoms cheerfully for the benefit of others and by so doing we prove that we're mature enough in Christ to pay our continuing debt of love to everybody even those who are difficult to love. He says in verse 19, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Now, when Paul says we're to make every effort He's literally telling us in the continuous present tense in Greek that we're to keep on pursuing without rest 
these two things. First, peace within the body. We're to promote peace within the body. Is your lifestyle one which promotes peace in the body or is your behavior divisive in the body? Now, in our skit that we had, and this was the first time I saw it, but Sophie on the end, played by LV, she was finding fault in things. That's divisive behavior. Now, it's okay to wrestle with those things, but we're going to be told later, keep that between you and the God, between you and the Lord. Wrestle with God on these issues. Are you one who's always finding fault? Are you one who, when you come into the church body, this is a magnificent work of Christ, not Calvary Chapel. I'm talking about the church of Jesus Christ. When you come into the body, are you looking to be offended? Well, somebody wasn't nice to me. You know, they told me I'd take my children to the children's ministry. Are you looking to be offended? Well, you're not promoting peace. And Paul says that we've got to keep on pursuing without rest peace in the body. If you're one of those Christians that's looking out at other Christians and telling people or even thinking about other people should act the way you act or dress the way you dress, you're no longer pursuing peace but division. We're all free to to enjoy our Christian freedom as long as it doesn't destroy somebody else's peace. The second thing we're to keep on pursuing without rest is the edification of the body. Not personal edification. The word for edification means to strengthen. This is actually in Greek an architectural word. It's, it's the sort of the strengthening that an architect designs in the plans for the builders to build. And we're to pursue every day, the strengthening of the body to which we belong. Is your freedom in Christ being used for the good of the entire body, both strong and weak believers? We need to think about these things, how our behavior affects others before engaging in that behavior. So he says, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean. But it's wrong for men to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It's better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother to fall. This is sort of the summary before we get to verse 22, the summary of what Paul's been talking about in this entire chapter. This is love in action. Now, the word translated better here is the Greek word kalos. And it means it's a beautiful thing to do. Now, I don't know about you, but if revival is going to happen in your heart personally, if revival is going to happen in our church, it's going to happen because Jesus is looking down from heaven and seeing a beautiful thing happening in this body. Where instead of judging other people or prejudging other people or, or having our own opinions and holding on to them so strongly that we condemn others for not sharing those opinions, God says the most beautiful thing that you can do is to let him change your heart. How do you do it practically? By understanding that these are areas that each one of us, as we said last week, is going to stand before God and give an account of. How many times in this one chapter alone has Paul said this exact same thing? To me, it seems like he said it a hundred times. When I first started preparing for chapter 14, all I could think about was, Lord, I've got to get through this in just one study Because you keep saying the same thing over and over and over. How many weeks in a row can the church listen to me say the same things over and over? And Jesus told me, over and over. He's repeating for emphasis because these are really important things. And I would add they're contrary to the instincts of our human nature, our flesh. If you want to be beautiful in the eyes of the Lord, we do it by being like he was and giving ourselves up for someone else. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. In other words, you don't have to share your opinion on things. You don't have to get engaged online or on Facebook with the current political discussions among Christians. You don't have to engage other people in the world because they disagree with you 
These are things that you keep between you and the Lord. You know, Paul says in one of his epistles, he says that after giving them all kinds of instruction, he says, and I love this, he says, if you disagree with me on these things, then ask God and he'll tell you you're wrong. (laughs) These are the things. Nobody needs your opinion. Nobody needs your view on whether they're drinking or smoking or or whatever it is they're doing that you don't agree with. They're going to R-rated movies. None of that matters. Your opinion has no value. And even sharing it with people in your family causes division. Especially men, we who are supposed to be the spiritual heads of our household, when we start speaking ill of others in our own homes, our families think it's okay and they follow suit. And the whole time we're guilty of not loving And we're actually quenching any work that the Holy Spirit wants to do in our hearts. We don't have to tell people what we think. I know that's so countercultural because everybody wants to know what you think. They want your life and their lives to be interactive. But we can just keep it between us and the Lord. There's so many things in my life. I told you last week I I don't go to R-rated movies. I don't go to movies that take God's name in vain. And I'm happy I don't. But, but I don't condemn any of you who do. This is something God has asked me to do. So I don't go home and talk to God about you. Do you believe they went to that movie? I know God's name was taken in vain 17 times. Pluggedin.com told me so. <laughs> I don't talk to God about you. I talk to Jesus giving thanks that he gave me a heart that's tender enough that I don't want to hear his name taken in vain. (coughs) You see, he can talk to you as he's spoken to me if that's what he wants for you. We just have to keep it between us and God. Again, nobody needs our opinion. And then he says this, bless, the word means happy. So that's the word I'm going to use. Happy is the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves. What he's saying here is if you're free or not free, this is between you and God. My life has nothing to do or of no or should be of no concern to you and, and, and the opposite is equally true. If you're free and what you do doesn't result in the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and again I want to say this from last week, if it doesn't conflict with what the Word of God says, A lot of people come to me and say, well, my conscience doesn't bother me. I think I'm okay to do this. And I can say, turn to Ephesians 5. You can't do that. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. You can't do that. Turn to Colossians chapter 4. You can't do those things. Well, my conscience is okay. And the Bible says if my conscience is okay, then these things are okay. It's not okay if it conflicts with Scripture. You all get that. But if... In these disputable areas, your conscience says something is okay and you do it and you keep it between you and Jesus, then Paul just said you're happy. I can enjoy my freedom. I can dress the way I want to dress. I can speak using the words I want to use as long as they're godly. If somebody wants to go to a movie and I want to go with them, I can go. If I want to go hunting, I can hunt. If I want to grow a beard, I can grow a beard. You see, those are the things that we can do without worrying about whether or not we're stumbling somebody else. But when we begin to make an issue of those very things, well, that's when we find that we're in trouble. God's word says you're happy. Remember this, however. In the context of our earlier discussion, You're even more blessed. That means you're happier when you give up your freedom for the weaker brother or sister. And then he says this in our final verse. But the man who has doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith and everything that does not come from sin as, or everything that does not come from faith is sin. Now in context, this verse is clear. It requires very little explanation. But I want to be sure that we get this. There are some people who simply cannot and will never be able to enjoy the freedom that others enjoy. 
Um, you know, I'm a... Now, I'm speaking to you as a guy who hasn't driven a car in 19 years. But I'm a sort of go-with-the-flow kind of guy. If I'm on the freeway and the freeway traffic is flowing at 75 miles an hour, I'm fine with that. Paul is not. She is a rule follower. She's the one doing the driving. Now, it took me about... 18 and a half of those 19 years to learn this. <laughs> but guess what? She doesn't need my opinion. Okay, I haven't learned it yet. <laughs> but, but, but I'm trying. <laughs> if I forced Paula to speed, she would be violating her conscience. Don't ever violate your conscience. If God has spoken to your heart about something saying it's wrong for you, it's wrong for you, don't do it. But always remember in the exercise of your liberties to be sure that you are more concerned about the people around you. The way you're representing or even misrepresenting Jesus in the process. A really good general rule to apply in this last part of the sentence, everything that does not come from faith is sin, is this one. If you have to ask someone if it's okay to do this, you know, is it okay for a Christian to drink? Is it okay for a Christian to smoke? Is it okay for a Christian to do these things? If you have to ask the question, it's probably an indication that God the Holy Spirit is already working on your heart and already provided the answers for you. And then our flesh sort of raises up its ugly head and we think, well, if somebody else gets to do it and they're a Christian, why can't I do it? Maybe Jesus has more ministry for you. Maybe he has a plan for you that is completely different from everybody else. Maybe yours is the heart he wants to begin this revival in. All you have to do is be available. Jesus, you asked me not to do this. I'm not going to do it. I told you last week, I have always been a movie person. I like them kind of movies I like have a lot of violence. They have bad language. Now most of them are rated R or take God's name in vain. We have walked out, Paul and I, of a lot of movies having paid our money and the $23 they charge for popcorn <laughs> and didn't get to see how the movie ended. Has it cost us anything? really hasn't at all. It's been a wonderful experience to say, you know what, Jesus, I love you more than the end of this movie. Now that's just us. But all of us have those things in our lives that we know that we're right on the edge. You know, let's see how much we can get away with and still be saved instead of seeing how close we can get to Jesus. We all have those things. What God is asking you to do is let love decide what you're going to do. <coughs> Timothy could have said, well, Paul, I'm a grown man. That's going to hurt, and I don't want to be circumcised. But imagine, as you read 2 Timothy, Paul's departing words to his young protege in the faith. Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. Timothy, preach the word. Timothy, mark this, in the last days there will be terrible times. Timothy, I'm going to entrust people that I love very much to you. Timothy would follow Paul in Ephesus. And all he had to do was sacrifice one little bit of his freedom to enjoy everything that God wants. If we're going to have a revival here at Calvary Chapel, it has to be bathed in love. That means coming to church can't be about you. It has to be about and for others. And maybe you're one of those who say, well, if, if that's the case, well, who's going to do stuff for me? Believe me, if your heart is to do for others, there will be lots of people doing back for you. That's what we live with here at Calvary Chapel. But make it the goal of your heart to get as close to Jesus as you possibly can and then quoting the Apostle Paul from the epistle to the Hebrews. 
Throw off everything that hinders your walk and the sin that so easily entangles. Stay clear of anything and everything that might inhibit your walk with Jesus. And I promise you, you feel like the sacrifices you made meant nothing. Because whatever you give up freely and joyfully, you leave your hands open for just a minute and God will give it back to you in abundance. And you'll just think, wow, why did it take so long? Disputable areas, they're always going to be those. When we first came to Texas, I was asked if it's okay for Christians to dance. I thought, well, why wouldn't it be? I didn't realize that some traditions think that's evil here. So if I'm going to go to a dance, and by the way, that would be one of the biggest upsets in the history of the world. <laughs> I wouldn't invite the fundamentalist Baptist who doesn't think dancing is okay. And you know what else? When I got to work the next day, I wouldn't tell him what a great time I had dancing so that the good I do could be spoken evil of. Anything not of faith is sin. Even though our context is legalism versus liberty, this is the most important principle in your individual walk with God. And what I want and I pray and will keep praying that you want is that revival in your heart so that we will truly love one another, putting others ahead of us. And when we do that, imagine Jesus smiling and saying, wait till they see what I have next. You know, when Pastor Rich and Raquel moved here from the Bronx, I love that he told us it's the only borough with a definite article, the Bronx. They had no idea that they were going to be meeting their future daughter-in-law and in all likely grandkids to come. But see, they said yes. They sacrificed what was comfortable to them. They sacrificed their freedom to be obedient. And the blessings have just now begun. That will be true in every single one of your lives. Anything not of faith is sin, so don't do it. And don't do it because you love Jesus. And then let that revival begin in you. That's what God is asking from us. And I've already said yes. And my prayer is that you will as well. Let's pray. <laughs>